when the researcher plans a study, the major thing is about data collection because his or her theoretical framework is ready. The researcher is confident what he or she wants to do. So objectives are stated, hypotheses are stated. Now in order to achieve those objectives or to test those hypotheses, what is needed is data. Now how to collect this data? There are various types of tools. Now we said that the research can be of quantitative or research can be of qualitative methodologies. Research can use either qualitative methodologies or quantitative methodologies or mixed methods. There are certain tools which are used for quantitative methodologies that means collection of quantitative data. There are some other tools which are used for collecting qualitative data and naturally when we mix the methodologies the similar tools are used for both. There are variety of tools available to a researcher for example questionnaire, interview schedule, rating scale, checklist, observation schedule. Many tests are there, achievement tests, diagnostic tests and even inventories. Today we are going to discuss about one tool which is called observation. Observation is a technique and observation schedule is a tool for collecting data. What is observation? Observation means somebody is going to observe. This somebody can be a researcher or a field investigator who goes to the field and observes what is happening. For example, if you want to evaluate a teacher's competencies, by just asking questions about knowledge, you will not get an idea about teaching competency. So you have to go to class and observe the class, how the teacher is behaving, how there is an interaction between teacher and student. All these events or phenomena need to be observed. So an observation technique is basically a data collection technique. This data collection may be by humans or people or by electric, electronic or mechanical way of collection of data. But major thing is data collection through observing. Observation involves systematically selecting, observing and recording behaviors, people, culture, communities, events, phenomena, anything happening in the field, but also to make meaning of these observations. Observations are different from questionnaire and interview schedule in that in getting, in collecting data through questionnaire or interview schedule, the researcher is dependent on the respondents, others. So the questionnaire has to be filled by the respondent and sent to you. When you ask questions as an interviewer, the respondent also has to answer those questions. Whereas in observation, it solely depends on the researcher or the observer, either directly or through camera lens if you are taking photographs or doing videography. But it is you or the researcher or the observer who is in the field and the observations totally depend on what he or she observes. Observation schedule is extensively used in the field of educational research, especially about teacher effectiveness, teacher characteristics, teacher behavior in the class. These things have to be observed. Now for example, Flanders interaction analysis category system gives us observation schedule where you can go to class and observe how the teacher is acting, how the teacher is behaving in the class. Generally we make a statement that teachers speak in class or teacher talk in class extensively. But do we have data? How do we say that? What is the percentage of teachers talk? So you take, a, take that schedule, observation schedule, go to class and observe for the whole class of say 40 minutes. And then the categories can be marked and then you know how much time the teacher was talking, how much time the students were talking, how much time there was an interaction. So instead of just making a statement that teachers generally talk for 70% of the time, you get exact data in hand if you observe a selected sample, random sample and then come out with a 
finding that becomes more authentic that becomes more data based finding because you have the findings through observation. You know that there are major two types of research methodologies quantitative and qualitative. In qualitative methodologies we generally use ethnographic studies and ethnographic studies or case studies where we study the phenomena, we study the cultures, we study the environment. In education setting ethnographic studies are conducted and their observation schedule is extensively used. We know that now that observation solely depends on the researcher and the researcher can give justice to it. But at the same time we must know that observation takes time. It is time consuming as compared to other tools and that is why its use is done very judiciously. Depending on the structure, depending on the purpose, depending on the objectives, the observation technique can be classified into many different types. One is participant and non-participant observation, other is structured and unstructured observation. Structure means controlled, unstructured means uncontrolled, you are not controlling. Say for example, you want to see indisciplined behavior of a child. You cannot control that when it happens, you just observe that and then come out with findings. So, the observation can be controlled or structured, it also can be uncontrolled, unstructured. It can be direct or it can be indirect observations. It can be overt or it can be covert observation. It can be obtrusive or it can be unobtrusive. Unobtrusive means the observation can be obtrusive or unobtrusive that is conspicuous or inconspicuous. Inconspicuous means the, res the researcher, the observer does not want to show that I am here. Whereas in participant we will see in short time that participant observation people know that this person is participating and also observing us. This is the difference between two. So, there are variety of observation types and the researcher must select as per the purpose, the time in hand and also the objectives. Now, let us see what is participant observation and what is non-participant observation. The term itself tells you participant observation means the researcher is participating wholeheartedly in the whole process. He or she is a part of it. Lassie defines this participant observation as the transfer of the whole person into an imaginative and emotional experience in which the field worker learned to live in and understand the new world. When this site experiment was conducted, satellite instructional television experiment in 1975, there were 2400 villages selected in six states and they were beamed for one year through satellite variety of educational programs were beamed. Now they wanted to study does it have any impact television, satellite television does it have any impact. In order to see that they must know what is their regular life and does this satellite education make any change in their life. So investigators, researchers were appointed in selected villages three months prior to the experiment. Now the villagers knew that he is a participant observer, he is going to stay here or she is going to stay here and observe us what we are doing. Of course slowly once they get used to you then they forget that you are a participant but the researcher definitely knows that he or she is a participant observer. So for three months they stayed there, then the whole experiment for one year and again after the experiment was concluded three more months. So totally they stayed there for 18 months and this was a participant observation. Similarly, if you want to study a school, the interactions taking place in school or the use of information and communication technologies in school, so going there for 5 minutes and observing it and coming back may not give you a full idea. So you be there, be one of them, be there for a whole week and observe it. The principal, teachers, everyone knows that you are there to observe what they are doing. So, it becomes a participant observation. So, the researcher goes to the field, lives there as one of them. 
the researcher becomes the normal member of that group. The researcher who is in the field is expected to join all activities, events, anything happening there. He or she cannot keep himself or herself aloof because it is a participant observation. So by participating in various games, villagers play, you would know how do they play, how do they enjoy, what are the challenges and many other aspects which you want to study. Many a times the group knows, group is fully aware that the participant observation is going on. Here is a person who is living with us and who is also observing us. But sometimes it happens that the main people know and everybody else does not know. That is also possible. Some people in the village or in community or in that organization know that you are coming there for observation. But not necessarily everyone knows. That is also possible. Participant observations are generally unstructured. The researcher does not go with the proper checklist and all the data tools but generally has an idea what is to be observed. Those categories are identified, we will see how observation schedule is to be prepared. But if you go prepared that I am going to observe this and those events or phenomena may not take place. So it is mostly unstructured, participant observation is unstructured and it is not planned. But it is direct because you are into the group. The participant because everyone knows that participant is there you can't be inconspicuous. Your presence is felt by everyone, so it is obtrusive. Though we have said that observation is fully controlled by the researcher or observer as compared to questionnaire and interview, some of the experts, researchers have criticized that observation tool as not so reliable. For example, Cohen and Mannion say that participant observations are subjective they are biased, they are impressionistic, they are idiosyncratic. Idiosyncratic means personalized, individual. So it is your observation. Some other person may be observing something else. Lacking in the precise quantifiable measures because you are observing and making notes. But this preciseness, quantifiable measures are required as we get them in experimentation or in survey. This is not possible through observation. This is the criticism, but we also can see how we make it more objective, more quantifiable. There are ways which support the enhancing of quantifiability as well as objectivity of observation tool. As compared to participant observation, there is another type which is called non-participant observation. So the title itself tells you that non-participant participation is not shown to everyone. That person or the researcher or the observer remains aloof, doesn't want to say that I am one of you, not mixing so much, being aloof. Now for example, when you want to evaluate a teacher's competencies, you are not being a participant observation. You have taken a role of evaluator, you sit at the back and observe. That person knows, the teacher knows that he or she is being observed. This is non-participant observation. In non-participant observation, the observer wants to remain unobtrusive. He or she does not want to show that his presence or her presence in the whole process. But he or she is there, the, the person who is being observed or the organization knows that the person is there, but person is not being one of the members of that organization or of that event or of that community. As compared to participant observation, non-participant observation has some advantages. One is that there is a detached perspective, detached role of the observer. And that is why you can be more objective. You are not participating, you are watching. So that distance is maintained. When you participate, say for example, you are participating in Holi. Though you are observing, sometimes you may forget your role as observer and that objectivity may be lost. Whereas in non-participant observation, the observer knows 
that he or she is only watching, only observing, not participating. So they can fully concentrate and that is why the observations are more focused. And as it is focused, they are observed systematically, so naturally it takes less time. Does that mean that non-participant observation technique is the best one? No, I don't think so. There are limitations and the researcher or the observer must select. Variety of types are available, variety of techniques are available, so you should select from that. What are the disadvantages of non-participant observation? The behaviors which can be observed through non-participant observation need not necessarily be complex. This is overt behavior which you are seeing and motives are not seen. So what you see may be superficial, may not be so complex and deeper. That is one disadvantage. When you participate, you talk to them, you are one of them, so many things come out, the motives come out, the ideas, the thoughts, the framework of mind, why they are doing this, this also comes out. Here in this non-participant observation, you are detached. You are only seeing the overt behavior and recording it. Similarly, the presence of observer, everyone knows that he or she is observing, not one of us. So that itself has an impact and people may show a different behavior. That means what you are behaving is already constituted. If people know that you are observing them, then the behavior changes and your findings may be affected because of this. Like participant and non-participant observation, there are controlled observation and uncontrolled observation. We have seen that participant observations cannot be controlled observation. They are generally uncontrolled. In controlled observation, the researcher controls the situation because he or she is interested in watching something. Now one such study was done by Mary Ainsworth. She was interested to find out how infants respond to brief periods of separation from their mothers. She created a controlled observation setup. Mother was told to go out for some time and the child was observed. What was observed? The four things were observed. Proximity and contacting seeking, contact maintaining, avoidance of proximity and contact, resistance to contact and comforting. The observer was supposed to observe these four categories. This is an observation schedule which was created horizontally, all those categories are written and vertically the intensity is written. How intense was this act? And the observer was supposed to observe the child under the control situation because the mother is taken out, mother is not there in the room. Now how the child behaves? So this is a controlled observation situation. As we have seen, there are uncontrolled observation. When the teacher is teaching in a class or you want to study indisciplined behavior of a child, you cannot create that. But you know for sure that you want to see indiscipline means what exactly, what exactly the child does when we call it is indisciplined behavior. Does he or she retorts? Does he or she denies? Does he or she changes place? What? What is the behavior to be observed? So you make a list of observations and keep that ready. But you cannot control, you cannot initiate or instigate the child to be indisciplined. So in such situations, it is not controlled, it is uncontrolled situation where the researcher or observer is observing the categories presence or also the intensity. The systematic observation also as we said, it is controlled and uncontrolled observations. So naturalistic setting, if you do that, you are not controlling it. This is called naturalistic setting. In this naturalistic setting, when we observe, generally which includes four categories. One is specimen record, other is behavior checklist, third is event sampling. Event sampling means the occurrence of events, when it is happening, how many times it is offering. So event 
sampling means you are trying to note the occurrence of a particular behavior. And the fourth is time sampling. Time sampling means you are taking a period. Say you are observing a child for one whole week or you are observing a child intermittently once or twice a week for the whole month. So this, this is called time sampling. The researcher has to plan in advance when you are going to observe in a naturalistic environment. The researcher is interested in designing observation schedule so that he or she can observe the event, the phenomena or people or the environment or situations which he or she is interested. We will see what are the steps in using observation as a technique and in that one of the step is to design observation schedule. But before going to that we must know what are the considerations for observational research. There are major three types of considerations. One is categories or types used to define the units of interest or attention and to define factors of interest about those units. These are the categories we are talking about. First we must identify the categories. The researcher also must be interested to control the means by which data are created, collected, recorded and made capable of being analyzed. Thirdly, the researcher is interested in controlling analytical procedures used on those data. That means how do we analyze that? We may analyze by participating into period or we may categorize them into subgroups or sub cases. We can identify the patterns, we can compare the patterns between patterns or between cases. So all these come under analytical procedures. So you want to control those. So for any observation technique to be more sophisticated, it aims at giving results, then the researcher wants to control these three things. Now let us see the steps involved in using observation technique. There are major seven steps. One is defining observational variables. Second, preparing observation schedule. Third, establishing validity and reliability. Fourth step is to conduct pilot testing. Fifth, recording of information using that observation schedule. Sixth step is supporting observations through various ways. We will see how the observation can be supported by using variety of other tools. And lastly, when you collect the data through observation, analyze and interpret the data. The first step of using observation as a technique is defining observational variables. There are three types of variables. One is descriptive, other is inferential and third is evaluative. This is given by Borg and Gall. Let us see what are these categories of variables. Descriptive means you are only describing. So this is the lowest level of intensity. It requires little inference. There is no inference required. You observe something and just note that this is happening. Whether the hand is raised, yes. That kind of observation is called descriptive observation. Means teacher talks in class, yes or no? Yes, teacher talks. What he is talking is not observed here, it is only observed teacher talks. Suppose you are observing for 10 minutes and then every 30, 30 seconds you are putting a tick whether teacher is talking. So it is only observing teacher is talking this 30 second, next 30 second, next 30 second. Now teacher is not talking. The fourth segment teacher is not talking. Like that if there are 20 segments and you put a tick mark in 15 of it, you are only observing the teacher is talking, teacher talks. This is called descriptive variable. The next variable is inferential variable. Here there is high level of inference is required. Here the occurrence is not recorded. What is recorded is inference. That means teacher is talking, that is one level, but teacher is talking confidently. Now this is inference. How did he or she infer that the teacher is talking confidently? That is a skill which the observer must have. 
That is why if you see the levels, descriptive is the lowest level, inferential is high level because there is high level of performance is observed and inferred. So, this is complex and this also requires training. The third level or highest level is called evaluative. So, the observer is expected to observe for evaluation. Now, for example, teacher explains a concept. This is an observation because you know the difference between explanation and asking questions. So, you have put a tick mark, the teacher explains. Now, teacher explains with confidence, yes, you have marked that, that is you have inferred the teacher is explaining with confidence. But now, is he right or wrong in explaining that? Is he giving correct examples or not? Is the teacher using correct linking words or not? This is evaluative variable. So, here the observer must be saying that the teacher correctly explains the term. The term correctly explains means you are evaluating that and that is why then the observer must know the process thoroughly. What he is explaining also must be known to the observer that is we are talking about content of explanation, not only the process of explanation. So, this requires high level of complex skills on the part of the observer. Here the quality ratings are not behaviors, but inferences made by the observer about the behavior of the person being observed. We have seen as we move from low inference to high inference, we see that the complexity of observance changes. Reed has said that any change in the observational task that makes it more complex tend to lower observer reliability. We will see very shortly that there should be reliability established of the tool. There can be two observers rating the same thing and are they saying the same thing? So, if the performance, if the categories level changes where inference is required, then naturally the reliability is at stake. The second step is preparing observation schedule. Now, we know which are the variables, which are the categories and what is the purpose, what we want to observe. Now, we can start preparing the observation schedule. There are standard tools available. For example, I just mentioned about Flanders interaction analysis category system. It is a standardized tool which is used for observation in the class. So, there are certain tools which are available for observing certain events or certain environments or certain people these can be used, but it is not always so. You may not get a standardized observation schedule, then you will have to prepare it for your own purpose. In observation schedule, there are two types of things which we want to observe, the presence or absence and then we can certainly use a checklist. You can make certain statements and just put a tick mark whether this was observed or not, yes or no. We also can prepare a rating scale to what extent it was observed. Teacher speaks for example, how fast or how slow. So, it is not speaks yes or no, we are interested how fast the teacher speaks. So, then there will be a rating scale. Rating scale can be used because we are interested not only in presence or absence, but we are interested in the extent of presence. So, we, we can prepare the statements and those statements can be observed using rating scale. Once the variables are identified, the statements are prepared, now your observation schedule is ready. You cannot go directly into the field use for use of this observation schedule, there are three more steps. One step is to establish validity of it. Validity means it should test what it is supposed to test. Validity can be increased of observation schedule by combining it with other tools. For example, questionnaire or interview schedule can be combined with observation schedule. By using other tool, we are cross validating the data which is collected by observation schedule. Validity also gets a threat by the means of tools which we used in the observation schedule and that is why we have to be extra careful in cross validating the data and this can be done by using some other tool in combination with observation schedule. 
So you observe people, but you also interview some of them so that the data collected by observation schedule can be cross-validated. The next step is to establish reliability of the tool. Reliability means it gives you the same results when you use it again or when it used by somebody else. So this is called inter-observer reliability. If two people use the same observation tool, observation schedule, they should come out with the same results. But they cannot come out with the same, exactly same results. So we find out the coefficient of correlation between two observations. It should be quite high, more than 0.8. It also means that if you are using it today and if you use it after five days, the same event, you should be giving the similar observations. If not, that means your tool is faulty. You are interpreting it differently. So inconsistent observation of the same observer also affects the reliability of the tool. You have to take care of both and try to make the tool as reliable as possible. The next stage is pilot testing. Your tool is ready. You have established its reliability. You have established its validity. Now you want to use it in real life situation, but before that you must conduct a pilot test. Pilot test, as you are aware about other tools, what we do, we select the similar sample and use the tool on them, observe them and then see whether it is giving you what you want. The results of pilot test will give you how much time it is taking, what are the challenges in observation, if you have any difficulty in understanding what is written there. So all these things, the challenges will come out if you are doing a pilot test. How people are responding when you are observing them, so you are ready for that. So all these aspects are studied when you are doing pilot test. So similar pilot tests can be conducted for this so that you are making your observation schedule foolproof. Now after pilot test, if you are making some changes, change them and then now your tool is ready to use in the field. The next step is recording information. Now what do we record in the field? These categories can be identified like this. One is duration recording, other is frequency count recording, third is interval recording, fourth is continuous recording, fifth is time sampling. Let us see each one of them in detail. First is duration recording. The researcher is interested how much duration this is happening. So how this can be recorded? We can re record using a stopwatch so that it gives you this happened for 30 seconds or for 1 minute and 15 seconds, whatever, because you have a stopwatch. You also can do this on paper, starting time this, ending time this. That is also possible, which gives you a duration of the recording. The next is frequency recording. So you are putting a tally mark how many times this happened. You know, when we were students, we used to put a tally mark, how many times a teacher is saying you know. So that is called a frequency tally mark. Here we are interested how many times the teacher is using the board, how many times the teacher's movements are there, how many times whatever. You have identified those categories and you are interested how many times this particular occurrence is taking place. So every time that occurrence takes place, you put a tally mark. This is called frequency recording. The third type is interval recording. Interval recording means you are setting up the interval. That means you are observing a particular category or whatever is happening in that interval. That interval can be pre-decided of 30 seconds, 10 seconds, 1 minute or even 3 seconds. For example, Flanders Interaction Analysis Category System records every 3 seconds. So every three seconds you are also putting a tally mark. That means it is a frequency recording and it is also a duration because you are talking about three seconds, ten seconds. So it is a combination of both. But the difference is that you are not concentrating only on one category. There can be many categories happening in the given time interval. So it is more comprehensive. The fourth category is continuous recording. Here we are not talking about one particular 
time interval, we are talking about the continuously whatever is happening is recorded. So, you can see that it is more challenging that anything and everything is happening there and then you have to make a record. So, sometimes some of the things may be missed out, but we will see how we can compensate for this continuous recording. One more category is time sampling. Here we are not interested in continuous observation or recording, we are taking samples. So, for example, we would be observing on the third week of every month or we would be observing this activity if you want to observe it during the examination. If we say that every second hour of paper, so you have decided on the time slots, periods and those periods are only observed. Why you have decided on that? You have your own reasons because your theoretical framework tells you that this particular time period would give you some particular observations more than others. We have seen that so many things are happening at the same time and observing that and noting down recording becomes a challenge. So, we have to support our recording which we are observing ourselves with some other tools or some with other ways. There could be three different ways, one is contextualizing, second is using videos and photographs and third is using audio recording. Let us see what contextualizing means. It means we have to understand the context. Now what is the context? Context of the observation can be a meeting, classroom, playground, staff development session, anything. So this is the context. The overall environment of the observation, overall environment of the observation means what is the atmosphere of the say of the classroom or the meeting room or the training conference room. We can prepare a plan and keep it ready because then this will aid your memory when you are recording various other observation. Contextualizing also means how many subjects were observed at a time, who are the people who participated in this whole observation process as not as observer, but the subjects they can be listed, their places where were they sitting, what whether if you are observing it say in the mall, where were they standing. So, the situation, the environment should be defined in terms of the subjects. The roles of subjects involved is also very important. In a class, there can be a teacher, there can be students, but the students can be prefects, the students can be monitors, the students have different roles and you are trying to observe them. If they are in groups, what kind of a role is played by each? If you are talking about a training situation, variety of things are happening, people are there, they have different roles. So, if we make note of all these things before starting the observations, this becomes easier for us to contextualize our observations. Who said what becomes easier to interpret if you know their roles. Sitting arrangement, who is sitting where, that is also important. Are you observing a group? Is the group sitting on a bench, three of them are sitting across that sitting arrangement and six of them are sitting around the table, small table that makes a difference. When you are observing, Sometimes if they are sitting in a round circle, in a circle, then observing all at one particular time without moving is not possible. So, you will also have to see how you would like to move around and observe them, observe each member of the group. Similarly, the timetable of a event, of this event is also very important. Generally, what you observe has a set time schedule. So, you know what is happening first then what and then what. I mean even if it is uncontrolled, the things happen, events happen in a particular uh, manner. So, if we record that, it, it becomes easier for us to contextualize this happened before actual training started. This happened after the training was over and they were saying this. So, that has a different context who said what is important, but when did they say that and what time did they say that, were they interacting during the interaction, during the training that is more important. Were they interacting informally before the training started that is also important. 
So, as an observer, all these observations are very important for you for interpreting it later on. The time at which any critical event happened, you are observing a training session and suddenly there is a heated discussion. When did it happen? Did it happen at the start or at the end or when they were, the, the teacher was explaining or when they were asked something. So, the time at which unexpected or such behaviors they happen, then that time is also very important for you to interpret later on. Because you are talking about how did the teacher handle this? This becomes very important, when did it happen? So, all these points are important for contextualizing any observation when we are making record of it. The other way to support the data is by video recording it or taking photographs. Either by video recording it or by taking photographs. When the micro teaching was introduced in teacher training institutions, there were paper based recording instruments, observation schedules, but this was also supported by video. So, the whole process of 5 minute session because it is micro, 5 minute session is video recorded and this can be used to supplement what we are recording on paper. Similarly, if video recording is not possible, we can take photographs which shows the behavior, important behavior of the people whom you are observing. The third is you can use audio recording for supplementing your observation schedule. Sometimes people say something, you want to record that, but before you record it, they have also already said something else. So, either you miss out on the previous data or the next data. If you want to support this, not happening this, you want all the data to be co collected, then the cheapest way is to record it. But please remember that when you use a tape recorder, when you use a video recording, then people are anxious about it, they are aware about it, then something is being recorded, then the way they say gets changed. So, actually you have to be a, you have to see a balance between these two, whether you want to get this data which is affected or whether you can afford to miss out some of the data. But if you take them in confidence that this will be audio recorded or this will be video recorded with their permission if you start doing this, then people after some time people get used to it and they do not look at the videos or they are not conscious about the audio recording. Now that you have recorded your observations using your observation schedule as well as supporting it with other tools and means, you have your data. Now this data needs to be analyzed and interpreted, that is the last step. For analysis, you must first, before you start the observation, you must first think about how you want to analyze, which statistical tools you want to use or you want to do this analysis qualitatively. Qualitative does not mean you have to write essays, you can also have percentages, you can also use some statistics there because you want to compare the cases, between cases you may have to identify the categories or trends while you are observing. You may have to compare the patterns and for comparing this, for identifying this, you need to have some kind of statistical tools if you think there are necessary tools. So, before you start observation, you must plan out how you are going to analyze. You want to score it, you score that and quantitatively you can analyze it. If you want to analyze it as a trend, you identify that as trends. The, once you analyze it, naturally you have to interpret. What does this score means? When you say this is significant, there is a significant difference, what do you mean by that? So, that interpretation is also very important. Observation schedule is fully dependent on the observer the researcher if he or she is playing the role of observer. But while observing, 
there are certain things which must be kept in mind because those affect the observation. These can be categorized into four. Effect of observer on observed, then observer bias, rating errors and contamination. Let us see each one in detail how these things affect the observations. The first one is effect of the observer on the observed. Now the observer goes to a class to observe a teacher. Teacher behavior changes just because someone is there to observe. This would have effect on the observations. Generally if the teacher is being sarcastic in a class, now he or she will not be so sarcastic, they may use more praise. So actually that is not a natural behavior of a teacher, but just because there is an observer in a class, this is an effect of observer on the observed. Second effect is the effect of the observer on the settings. Just because there is a presence of observer, this observer is not a part of the whole uh, situation or environment. Now that observer is there, this may affect, this may change the climate or the environment of the situation being observed. Generally, the interactions in a classroom are spontaneous. Just because there is a third person sitting in the class, all the members of this environment, the teacher and the students may be aware of that and that spontaneity may be affected and people become more formal. They know how to behave. So the whole setting, it was informal setting, suddenly it becomes a formal setting. Everyone starts talking formally. The third is observer personal bias. The systematic error is traceable to the characteristic of the observer or the observational situation. Observer may have soft corner or soft feelings for a certain group of people or a community or an event. Now his or her own bias gets transferred into the observation and the observations get affected. The observer does not have a positive attitude towards the group of people whom he is observing or she is observing, then the kind of activities, the interactions they have may be underreported by the observer because already there is a bias that these people are not doing what they are expected to do. This may get, the reporting may get affected unknowingly just because of the bias of the observer. Error of leniency which means the observer tends to rate most of the things favorably. This is called leniency. Actual behavior may not be so, but because the observer is lenient, he or she tends to rate the, the observed or the situation in most favorable manner. The next error is error of central tendency. That means if you are using a rating scale, the observer selects to be more at the central. Instead of giving any extreme rating, he or she tends to give the middle one. This is known as error of central tendency. There may be a thought behind it, why to unnecessarily give too much of favorable ratings or too much of non so favorable, not so favorable ratings so that creating ill feelings. So the observer tends to be giving the rating centrally. How this can be avoided? Instead of having 5 points rating scale, we can have 4 point rating scale. So there is actually no central, you are forcing the observer to take some side. Otherwise what happens? Strongly agree to strongly disagree and in between there is a column, middle column says not, con not so sure or do not know, then they, they, they try to put their tick mark there. So you can avoid that and instead of having 5.7 point rating scale, you can have 4 point or 6 point rating scale. The next one is halo effect. Halo effect means when you are observing something, before observing what impression you have about that group, that affects the observation. So if you know this school is very good, the teachers are very nice, very good hearted teacher, 
that has effect on your observation. Actual observation may be something different, but just because you have good feelings about the school, about the locality, about the teacher, that has effect, that should not be having effect on the observer's observation, but it has. This is called halo effect. So the observer must be aware about this effect. Another error which can happen is because of observer omission. You are missing out something. So many things are happening at the same time and you really do not know which are the things which you note down. The things which you catch your attention because of your interest and your attitude, you may report them, but some just go without reporting. So there are omissions. Actually 10 things happened and you mentioned only 7, so 3 are missing. This effect is called observer omission. One more error occurs which is called as observer drift. Drift means drifting. You are drifting somewhere else. Originally you thought this is a category to be observed. As you go along, then you are drifting from this category to some other category. It happens because you start observing and new categories start coming in. Actually your tool does not have that, but you start observing those as you go along. And the original category gets out of your focus, you do not observe that. This is known as observer drift, which should be observed, the observer should be aware that this drift should not happen. Otherwise, your analysis and your interpretation will suffer because all the categories which you originally had, they were a part of your theoretical framework. So now changing over a period of time, if this happens, if the observation goes on for a very long time, this may happen. But that's why the observer must be aware about the categories which you started with and the categories you are interested in now. One more error is called reliability decay. Decay means it goes on decreasing. If you take one example, you are talking about uh, training situation, you are training some people. Suppose if it is on the job training. So the reliability of inter observer reliability is very high because motivation is very high. Now what happens, the training is over. And now slowly the, the observers are not so particular about observing because their motivation has also gone down and that is why there is a reliability which goes down. So whatever they are observing, they may observe casually, they are not so specific about it. This is called reliability decay. This is because of the lack of motivation after the program is over. Contamination is another error which occurs while observing. Contamination implies the observer's understanding or knowledge about one aspect of the study which gets transferred to other. When he or she observes the setting for something else, his or her understanding about another part of the study has an influence on this observation. For example, if you take an experimental study where you have a control group and an experimental group. And suppose you are thinking about developing social skills in experimental group by using a treatment, you have created one program which may have influence on the social skills. Now the experimenter is the observer, the observer knows which is a control group and which is an experimental group. Now his or her understanding that this treatment which is planned to be given for enhancing the social skills to a particular group, experimental group. If he is attached to that, he or she may be thinking yes that it is improving the skills. So naturally this has contaminated his or her mind. So when he or she observes the experimental group, generally he will tend to give different observation ratings to the experimental group than the control group. This is an example of contamination and because this is personal, the observer must be aware that this is happening. He should not or she should not be giving some kind of benefit to the experimental group. But this also may happen that observer is not a part of this experiment and being very curt, he may be doing the other way. 
experimental group is thoroughly checked, observed and maybe undue advantage is given to the observations. This is also possible. So contamination can happen in both ways. Only thing that observer must be aware. We have listed many errors which occur during observation. Now some of these can definitely be taken care of. They can be reduced because they are on the part of the observer. Now this requires lot of training. It is said that observation, it is easier said than done. Because what you are observing, it has to be recorded in that proper perspective. You are observing something and you are recording something because of your interpretation of it while you are observing. You are attaching meaning to that observation while you are observing and by interpreting if you are observing that, instead of interpreting that at the end, this may affect the whole process. Because of the bias of the observer, many things go haywire. So while using observation schedule, one has to be extra careful in training people so that inter-observer reliability is established. Even self-reliability also needs to be established because that for one group if you are different and for another group you are posing a different personality that is not acceptable. So all these reliability issues have to be handled, addressed and then the observation schedule can be used. If you collect data with impersonal mind, not a biased person going there, then that data is more reliable and the findings which you get are more reliable too. When we want to use observation as a technique and observation schedule as a tool for data collection, there are certain considerations which a researcher must have in mind. Let us see some of these. One is role of the observer. On the basis of the role of the observer, your use of technique, your preparation of technique, your interpretation of the results gets affected. What is the role of observer? Fully participant observer, we know that it is you use participant observation. To the other extreme, it is onlooker, that is non-participant observation. And in between, there is a partial observation. That means you are not taking fully participant role and you are not taking fully non-participant role. This is in between, this is called partial observations. So role of observer decides which type of observation to be used. The second one is the purpose of evaluation to others. What you are portraying? What you are telling others, what is the purpose of your evaluation? There are, if this purpose is known to people, using that there can be four different categories. One is you are giving full explanation, why you are doing it, what you intend to do, this is called full explanation and the other extreme is false explanation. You are not giving them correct explanation knowingly. You want to misguide them so that their behavior does not change. So these are two other extremes. In between, there is a partial explanation. You do not give them the full explanation. You tell them only a part of it so that they are aware, but they are not too aware and they do not decide beforehand how they should behave. And then there is a covert evaluation. Covert evaluation means Overtly, you are not telling them this you are evaluating. You are doing it without telling others. Keeping these things, how, how you are interacting with people for telling them about the purpose of evaluation, your types of observation which you select gets affected. Duration of the evaluation observations also decide how you want to observe. For example, single observation will have limited duration, whereas long term observations will take more time and it will also give you multiple observations, not only single observation. So time, time period that also is connected with what type of observation technique you select. Fourth is your focus of the observation. Is your focus narrow? or if is your focus broad. That will decide how you observe. 
if your focus is narrow then you are observing a single element or a component in the program that means it is a narrow focus focus is narrow means the components are limited single component or two components of the program we are not talking about the whole program if you introduce some new thing to your nine standard students you want to evaluate but this program is very complex program and you cannot evaluate the whole thing at one point of time so you are selecting only one part of it and seeing its impact for example in that whole program assignments different types of assignments are given so you are talking about your focus is only that you are observing how students behave how do they interact while doing the assignments it's a narrow focus whereas the focus can be broad you are taking the holistic view you are talking about the whole program and it is entire program is observed and all elements of the program are observed in snit women's university we took a program which is called school improvement program in one of its conducted schools this school improvement program was introduced initially for one and a half years and not only the teaching learning practices were changed many other inputs were changed including food for students study center for students clothes for students so many things were brought in music classes school band participation of students in road safety program and many other programs were identified and students were involved in that now you can see that this is a very comprehensive school improvement program it was a system designed now if you want to observe how it is happening you want to evaluate how it is happening then your focus is broad you have to design different observation schedules for different types of occurrences then the focus is very broad but if out of this you want to see only one thing that is what is an impact of introducing a music teacher twice a week to every student what impact did it have is the number of student opting for music change is the number of student participating in various competitions change is the number of student getting awarded change so you are only talking about one small program your focus is narrow so observing students participating interacting learning using different modes all these things for one small program which will a component of a program will have a narrow focus depending on the area of focus your tools will change one more aspect which affects your selection is portrayal of evaluator role of the observer is this role known that is overt observation the other extreme is covert observation and in between the observer's role known by some not by everyone you can see that if you make overt observation it is participant observation and everyone knows about it that you are a person who will be participating for this purpose even in non participant observation if people know your role why you are there then they are clear everyone knows about it this is called overt observation the other extreme is covert no one knows why you are there even in participant observation this can be done but cannot be done uh, entirely if you go to a new village people would definitely ask you why you are here what is your purpose what do you want to see so you have to answer them if not to all 100 1000 villagers at least to some you have to tell but with non participant observation you can definitely have a covert observation observation is a very good tool for data collection it saves time it is economical provided you use it judicially one must know how to use it judicially and how to interpret the findings if they are qualitative or quantitative way of analyzing thank you